Okay. Um, Diana will answer questions after the presentation. So please save some of your questions for the end or drop them in the chat during the presentation. And I'll make sure that we touch base with those after um, presentation ends. As with the library's in-person programs, any behavior or activity deemed disruptive or disrespectful of others is not permitted. Um, it's my pleasure now to introduce you to Diana Stampler, who has presented about Michigan's historic and unique destinations and activities since 1997. Diana has a degree in communications from Western Michigan University and over 20 years of experience in radio broadcasting and public speaking. You may have seen Diana's contributions in a variety of Michigan magazines, or you may know her from her many, many connections in the Michigan community. She's currently a member of the U.S. Lighthouse Society, the Great Lakes Lighthouse Keepers Association, the Michigan Maritime Museum, the Historical Society of Michigan, and she holds titles from the Michigan Hemingway Society, Ferris State University Hospitality Advisory Board, Michigan Brewers Guild, Kent County Hospitality Association, and Michigan Craft Distillers Association. So without further ado, please turn your attention to Diana. Thank you very much. Uh, excited to uh, to share with you all tonight some stories of some women who I consider to be real pioneers um, in their field, but also just uh, in the state of Michigan in general. A little bit more on my background. Um, I was born and raised just north of Kalamazoo, a small town called Plainwell, and went to Western Michigan University. And even though I grew up in West Michigan, about 45 minutes from Lake Michigan, I really wasn't aware as a child and, and young adult um, about the significance of lighthouses to Michigan. And uh, Michigan actually has more lighthouses than any other state, uh, close to 130 of them. Um, but in, in 1997, I started working for an organization in Grand Rapids called the West Michigan Tourist Association. And my first project with them was a directory magazine called the Lake Michigan Circle Tour and Lighthouse Guide. And I was charged with cataloging all of the lighthouses on Lake Michigan. And I had a spreadsheet and it had the light and the city it was in. And I had all of these um, columns and I had to add information like when the lighthouse was built, how tall the tower was, was it active? There, was there a museum? Could you spend the night there? And two of the categories were, did they have a female lighthouse keeper, which became an area of interest? And the other was, was it rumored to be haunted, which also became an interest area. And in fact, I wrote a book about that a couple of years ago about haunted lighthouses of Michigan. And ironically, many of our ladies are at haunted lighthouses. So I don't know what that means about female lighthouse keepers and ghosts per se, but um, these were fields that really drew my attention and brought me in to realize the significance of lighthouses, but particularly uh, fascinated with the story of the keepers, uh, their, their families, their dedication to their service. And so out of Michigan's 130 or so lighthouses, we have uh, countless keepers and about 60 women have been identified as serving either as head keepers or assistant keepers or even um, unofficial keepers through the service. And that's a pretty significant thing because these jobs back in the 1800s and even up until the 1930s were government jobs. They were um, keepers that were appointed by the office of the president. And to have women working in that field was significant. You had female um, postmasters, uh, teachers, and a few other things, but for the most part, women were not really working outside of the home and certainly weren't contributing to, um, to the federal government. So that was a key thing. What was also incredibly interesting is that these women were being paid the same salary as their male counterparts. So if a woman took over uh, a lighthouse, usually it was because uh, their husband was the keeper and perhaps he passed away or was sick. Um, she would be instated in that position and making an identical salary. And those salaries ran uh, anywhere from 300 to $600 in the early part uh, of the service. So 
or early 1800s. Um, and to kind of give a comparison on that, teachers in the 1880s were paid between 300 and 400 or maybe $500 a year for teaching. Uh, a lighthouse keeper would have been in that same general reign, but a postmaster in the 1880s was paid between a thousand and six thousand dollars a year. So um, it's interesting because lighthouse keepers obviously were much more um, physical jobs. They were uh, remote. They were very dangerous. They were in charge of lighthouse services as well as often um, a rescue, a light saving station services. So um, to see that they were really not paid very well for the time was significant. However, they were given a house in which to live uh, and they didn't have to pay rent for that house. And they had all of the things that they needed like uh, wood or oil to heat the house for their family. Um, so the perks in some of those cases um, were added uh, in a, uh, you know, as part of that, that salary. Um, so real quick, before we get into the presentation, I'm going to introduce you to about 20 different female keepers. I'm going to ask a trivia question, which is a little hard to do on Zoom. So if you want to put the answer in chat, you can do that or just hold on to it. and We can discuss it at the end of the program as well. But my, my trivia question to you is, who is the most famous female lighthouse keeper in the history of the world. And you're gonna sit there and go, I don't think I really know. You probably don't know many female lighthouse keepers by name anyway. Um, and this isn't someone attached to Michigan specifically, um, but certainly a, a female, a lighthouse keeper recognized around the globe, uh, but on American soil. Um, and when I show you the picture, you will go, oh, yes, I totally get it, that the Statue of Liberty is, in fact, the most famous female lighthouse keeper in the history of the world. Um, and she, of course, is guiding the harbor uh, there in New York. Okay, so now we're going we're gonna to get started. Um, as I mentioned, about 60 women who have had uh, identification as keepers, either head keepers, assistant keepers, sometimes official, sometimes not. Now, almost every wife of a lighthouse keeper is an unofficial keeper in some capacity because lighthouse keepers enlisted the help of their families to keep the light going. And they did this for one key reason. If the male keeper, the head keeper became ill um, and couldn't do his job or he was injured and couldn't do his job, the family had to step up and help because if not, he would lose his post and not only would they lose their salary for that, but they would lose their home as well. And so it often was a family affair. Now the wives would assist and in many cases with the women that are identified on this sheet, um, if they were recognized as an assistant keeper or a head keeper, that meant that they were recognized by the US Lighthouse Service, the federal government or the Coast Guard in later years. And also that they were uh, receiving compensation for their service. So um, these women are, are known and there are several publications that I'll share with you at the end of the program that will give you more information about these female keepers and their service. Um, not just here in Michigan, but across the country. So we're gonna to start today in Whitehall, home of White River Light Station. And in the 1860s, um, a gentleman by the name of Bill Robinson and his wife, Sarah, came to, Eng came to Michigan from England with seven of their eventually 13 children. So they, they had plenty of people to help with that lighthouse upkeep eventually. In this photograph here, uh, Bill Robinson is uh, the gentleman, the older gentleman second from the right, uh, and the gentleman on the far right is his grandson, William Bush. Now, when Bill and Sarah came to Whitehall, there was no lighthouse, but this was a 
thriving community and it was building up around the lumbering industry. In fact, much of the lumber to rebuild Chicago after the great fire in the early 1870s came from West Michigan. And so Bill got there uh, and was surprised that there was no lighthouse to guide all the ships that were coming in and out of the White River. And so he began to petition the lighthouse service to have a lighthouse built. He kept diligent records of all the ships that came in and he and Sarah lived there. And when they finally built a lighthouse in 1875, Bill was appointed as the first keeper and he and Sarah moved in uh, to the lighthouse and um, they lived there. And if you've been to this lighthouse, it's not terribly large. Um, they actually had 11 children that lived into um, adulthood. But Sarah passed away in 1891. I believe she had a stroke. Um, and so Bill stayed on as the keeper and his children, both the boys and the girls, and later some of his grandsons um, ended up helping to keep the light going. And William Bush was appointed as the keeper after Bill retired. Uh, and so Bill was allowed to live there with William Bush and his wife, who was assisting with the keeper duties uh, at that time. So this is, a, this is a beautiful photograph of Sarah. It was found in the 1980s and hung in the lighthouse. And this is a, a room upstairs they believe was uh, likely the nursery. And uh, there are many artifacts on the wall of the Robinson family. And uh, this is where Sarah's ghost hangs out. Uh, she is one of our female keepers who is also uh, haunting her beloved lighthouse. And uh, I've had several people have encounters with her over the years. But one of my favorite stories um, coming out of White River Light Station was Francis Worry Johnson. I gave this presentation earlier today with the Historical Society of Michigan, and I was so excited that Francis's daughter, Holly, was on the program. And I got a chance to chat with her briefly, uh, literally chatting in the chat function. Um, and uh, it was wonderful to get, to get a chance to know that she was out there. Frances and her husband, first husband, Leo Worry, were um, keepers at the White River Light Station in the 1950s. They were during the Coast Guard era. They were civilian keepers. And it was actually Leo who was the main person in charge of the light. But he was from the Upper Peninsula. And shortly after their service began, he decided that he really uh, was not fond of keeping a light and also was really not fond of the Lower Peninsula. So he went back to the UP, settled in near Marquette and worked at the, um, the Huron Mountain Club, if you're familiar with that exclusive uh, property up near Marquette. And Frances remarried and um, she ended up staying on at the lighthouse. And in the 1950s, uh, she was taken uh, on a trip to New York and she was a guest on a television show out there. Um, and it was a pretty significant deal for someone from the Whitehall area. She was actually a contestant on What's My Line. And if you're familiar at all with this show, uh, basically there's a panel and they bring in professional people and through a series of questions, they try to guess the profession of the person uh, on the stage. And they were never able to determine that uh, Francis was a lighthouse keeper. They got pretty close. They got that she worked for the government uh, and such, but she won $50. I believe she trained from Michigan to New York. They put her up in a hotel and she was really proud of that whole thing. And at the end of the program, I actually have that YouTube video from that segment and I'll post it in the chat if anybody wants to click on it and look at it later. Um, about 15 years ago, I actually presented this program in Whitehall and Frances was the guest of honor. So she's there sitting in her rocking chair and I got a chance to chat with her a little bit and talk with her about her life. Um, she was just this funky lady. I really enjoyed her. She reminded me a lot of my grandmother. Um, it was pretty funny because she she didn't have anything good to say about that first husband who left her and went back to the UP. Um, so that was pretty funny. Um, but uh, she passed away just a few years ago. 
So the woman standing next to Francis is Karen McDonald. And Karen is the most recent female uh, to tend to the lighthouse and actually run the museum at uh, Whitehall. It's the White River Light Station Museum. And she was there until about five years ago when the Sable Point Lighthouse Keepers Association took over management of this lighthouse. Um, but she was an avid historian. She lived at the light. They kind of divided it out and she had a little uh, a, a duplex area where she and her son lived and she took care of the light and manned all of the tours until she um, until about five years ago. I believe she is now in California. Uh, so we're going to make our way up the coastline to South Manitou Island. And if you've never been to this beautiful island, it's part of the Sleeping Bear Dunes National Lakeshore. And you can take a ferry boat from Leland um, and they do day trips out to South Manitou and they come in on the docks and you actually have about uh, three or four hours on the um, on the island. And you can walk out to the lighthouse and climb the tower um, and it is a, a beautiful little experience. Now in the 1860s when this light was built there were over 250 people living on South Manitou Island so you can see in this map all of the various farmsteads. Uh, they had a cemetery, they had a one room school, they had a Coast Guard life saving station, the lighthouse, uh, and they did a lot of farming out on the island as well. And one of the more noted families um, at this lighthouse and on the island itself uh, were the Sheridan family. And I was fortunate over the last 20 years to build a friendship with descendants of that family who live in Allegan County. And they've provided me with many of the images uh, for this. Now, this is a fairly tall lighthouse. And given that, that it is so tall, it's also the deepest natural harbor in um, Lake Michigan here. And it was a very vital stop for ships that were traveling between Chicago and New York because they could get in, the larger ships could get into the harbor there to get the supplies that they needed or take refuge during rough seas. And so, all of these things made this lighthouse an incredibly important one for Northern Lake Michigan. Now, the head keeper there was, was Aaron Sheridan. Aaron was a Civil War soldier, and it was very common for uh, veterans of the Civil War to be appointed as lighthouse keepers because of the government appointments. So Aaron um, was hired as the head keeper of the lighthouse, and uh, they came in in 1872, and Julia was recognized and paid as his an official as an official assistant keeper. But Aaron lost the use of his arm, one of his arms in battle. And because of that, because of the location and the importance of the light, the um, the height of the tower, uh, all of these reasons were why Aaron or why Julia was part of the official service there. So Aaron brought in a salary of about $350 a year, Julia probably about $150, um, and they lived at the lighthouse and they raised six sons during the 12 years uh, that they were at the light. And um, they were active in the service until they died in a tragic accident in uh, March of 1878. And on that day, they had actually taken uh, this sailboat or a boat similar to this. It's called a Mackinac. It's a 25 foot open air sailboat and, and all the lights had boats similar to this. Um, they hired this gentleman in the other picture, his name was Christian Ankerson, and they hired him to sail them to the mainland because with one arm, Aaron couldn't sail and Julia, um, had with her their nine month old son, Robert. And um, I don't know necessarily, uh, I think, I don't know if she had to go for official lighthouse business or I al almost think that they had to go to the mainland for um, to maybe see a doctor, maybe Robert was sick because I can't really imagine a mother taking a nine month old across the waters of Northern Lake Michigan in March when the water was probably just barely unfrozen. Um, but on the return trip that day, the boat capsized as it was approaching the island and Aaron and Julia and Robert all died that day. Um, 
Christian did survive. He actually clung to the overturned boat and he was rescued the next day. And then there was an inquisition and he um, was investigated, but they determined that it was a, a weather related accident and he uh, was not charged in any way for any wrongdoing involved in that accident. Um, the bodies of the Sheridans were never found, and the five other brothers who were, I think, in age between uh, about three and 16 were sent to live with other family members. Now, George Sheridan here, he was the second oldest son, and he actually became a lighthouse keeper himself, served primarily in southwest Michigan, and was the only officially trained uh, lighthouse keeper at the Kalamazoo River Lighthouse in Saugatuck. And he was there with um, his wife, Sarah. And Sarah was more of an, an unofficial keeper at the light uh, up until the very end. Uh, the lighthouse uh, was built in 1859, but was decommissioned in 1914. And at that time, um, George actually into a mental institution in the area. Uh, he had suffered with depression and mental issues most of his life after what happened to his family. And he was really struggling uh, with that. And in 1914, uh, at the time that the light was de decommissioning and he was actually getting shipped out of state to a new, to a new light, Sarah informed him that she was not going to go with him and neither were their three children. So I think all of this stuff came to head at that time, and it was really just more than George could handle. Uh, so he checked himself out of the uh, asylum and went to visit a cousin who was a keeper at the Gross Point Light in Evanston, Illinois, where he took his own life. And because of all of that, Sarah actually, signed the documents to end the service of this light in 1914. So she kind of was an acting keeper uh, and finalized that process. Uh, she ended up staying on in Saugatuck. She lived in this, um, this little house here in town and took in laundry to make ends meet. And that house was later turned into um, the lighthouse keeper gift shop in downtown Saugatuck. Um, and she, uh, the, many of the descendants of the family remain in this area. Sarah Lane, uh, she was the wife of a lighthouse keeper named John Lane. And uh, this is their daughter, Minnie, Minnie as a child, and then also later on as an adult. And Sarah and John actually began their service um, in the Detroit area at the St. Clair South Channel Range Light, it's literally the longest lighthouse name I have in any of my presentations. Um, so they lived in this larger lighthouse in the middle of the St. Clair River, and they would have been responsible for that light as well as the secondary light, the range light, um, located some distance away. So they would have to take a boat back and forth between the two. If they had two lights, they were allowed to have both of um, them, both John and Sarah uh, serving in the, in the service. And a little later at the end of the program, I'll actually um, go into a little bit more about what a range light is um, because I'll, I'll need to actually kind of show you um, full screen a little bit about how those operate for those who are not familiar. Um, so they worked at these lighthouses until they transferred on up into um, 1878 when they went to the Old Mission Lighthouse, which is at the end of the Old Mission Peninsula uh, in Traverse City. And John was an assistant keeper here at the onset, but he was quickly promoted uh, to head keeper. And, um, but his health declined shortly after that. And so um, Sarah was responsible for much of the upkeep of the lighthouse uh, until his passing in, uh, in 1906. And she actually took on the head position for a brief period of time before, uh, before she left. And uh, 
one of the things I really found interesting about Sarah was this newspaper article that appeared in the Grand Rapids News in 1905. And this is when John, her husband, was still alive, but was ill. And so she was taking care of many of um, the duties. I just thought it was fascinating that um, the newspapers saw this as a, a valid news story, that they were fascinated enough with, with her and her service uh, to protect uh, the shoreline and to, uh, to be a service of aid to the, to the sailors and ships that came through this area. And in this article, she talks about this one particular day on the job, um, and it's under the, the header on the second column, Injured While Attending Light. And in it, she talks about this storm that came in one day, and she was going up into the tower to um, check the light and make sure that the wick was still burning and that the Fresnel lens was still sending its, its light signal out for ships that may be in trouble during this storm. And I'm if you've ever climbed a lighthouse, you know when you get uh, to the top, to the lantern room, it's a um, it's a metal floor, it's like a sheet metal floor, and there's a, a door that locks to protect that area. So she unlocks it and flips the door open, and she's going to make her final uh, ascent up into the um, into the lantern room when somehow and apparently the tower was not weatherproof or windproof the wind came up and it actually uh made that door close down before she got through while she was having her hand on the floor and it chopped off the end of her finger and she apparently just pushed the door open and made her way up and dealt with the light and she says in the article that it was several minutes before she looked down and realized there was blood everywhere and realized the tip of her finger was gone. And she said she thought she should have passed out, but she had a job to do, so she couldn't. So she finished what she had to do. She got the light lit, made sure it was all safe, and after finishing her duty, then she dealt with her finger. And that really spoke to me as to the dedication that these lighthouse keepers had for others over themselves, and particularly for women to just not even think about it, but just keep moving along in, in getting the job done. Next, we're going to head over to uh, Beaver Island to the St. James Harbor Light. Uh, Beaver Island actually has two lighthouses, one in the community of St. James when you come into the village, and then one at the south end of the light or of the island. And this lower picture here shows uh, keeper Peter Kinley and his two daughters, Effie and Mary, and they became our youngest lighthouse keepers. Now, they were not young girls as they appear here but when they were in their teenage years their father took ill and so they stepped up and took care of the lighthouse and took care of him um, during his final years of service and he ended up um, actually retiring and uh, was um, was finished with his service in 1869 and at that point, the keeper became a man by the name of Clement Van Ripper, or perhaps it's Van Riper. I've never gotten the official um, pronunciation on that. Um, but he and his wife, Elizabeth, came in in 1869. Elizabeth was just 25 years old at the time that they came in. And she actually wrote a book years later after she retired called The Child of the Sea and Life Among Mormons. And if you are familiar at all with Beaver Island history, they had a large Mormon population on the island led by a self-proclaimed king named James Strang. And she was a child, a young adult during the time of Strang's reign. And in her book, she talks about 
a lot of that uh, and their island experiences. And at the end of her book, she talks about uh, how her husband is appointed as the head keeper of the lighthouse. And he's only there for a couple of years um, before he dies in a, uh, in a shipwreck accident. Um, it was uh, November of 1872, and a schooner called the Howland had made refuge into the harbor there at Beaver Island. And as Clement was the keeper, he had to go out and try to save the crew and anything that was on that boat. And in that process, he died. And his body never was recovered. And in her book, Elizabeth talks about how um, losing a loved one and never recovering the remains was just such a tragedy uh, for her. And she actually lost two brothers um, during uh, shipping accidents on the Great Lakes as well. And because of that, um, she actually um, was so dedicated to maintaining her service as a lighthouse keeper. So they appointed her as the head keeper on Beaver Island. And um, she served there. Uh, she was remarried to a man by the name of Daniel Williams. And uh, she stayed at that lighthouse until 1884, at which time she requested a transfer to a new light that had been built in Harbor Spring. And this is the Little Traverse Light. And she was the very first keeper to serve here. And she ended up serving here until 1913. And she was very dedicated. Her husband let her do her job. Um, she felt an incredible passion and sense of duty um, to tending to the light. Uh, again, she is also recognized in the newspaper uh, and this is a private uh, light. It's on Harbor Point, which is a, a secluded private part of Harbor Springs. Um, and uh, they offer a tour every five or six years where you can actually uh, go through that, through that lighthouse. Now, um, Elizabeth never had any children with either of her husbands, but she and Daniel were very well uh, known in Harbor Springs and they would host musical gatherings at the lighthouse. Uh, they, uh, her husband played the, uh, the violin, he played the guitar, she played the piano, and they would often host gatherings out at the lighthouse. They would host pictures on the lawn. They were very well uh, loved by those folks who lived in this area. Uh, so she ended up uh, serving there until 1913. They ended up retiring and moving Charlevoix, um, and she was there in the two lighthouses for 44 years. As far as I can tell, she is the longest serving female keeper in Michigan and perhaps even in the Great Lakes. And uh, for the last several years, I've actually been trying to get her uh, inducted into the Michigan Women's Hall of Fame. Uh, last year, she finally made it to the semifinal round, and so hopefully this year uh, she will make that in there, and uh, I'm actually working on the application, which needs to be submitted yet uh, this month. Uh, so she retires in, um, in November of 1913. She and Daniel moved to Charlevoix, and they live um, for 20 more years. And they actually passed away within 24 hours of each other in January of 1938. Um, and uh, so they were together right up until the very end. And they are buried at the cemetery in Charlevoix, um, which is uh, just south of downtown out by the airport, if you're familiar with uh, that community at all. Now, Female lighthouse keepers had to tend to the light. They had to tend to the grounds. They had to keep the house always clean inside and out for surprise inspections or for visitors. And they had to raise their families. And at the Squaw Point Lighthouse, which is um, located in Northern Lake Michigan, um, we had Kate Marvin, who not only tended to the light, but took care of her 10 children. 
after her husband passed away. She um, lived at the lighthouse uh, for six years and she was just the second keeper of the light. Her husband was the first. She was there from 1897 to 1904. Um, and at that point, she remarried and retired from service, um, but clearly probably enlisted the help of her older children to help with the tending of that lighthouse. And now we have made our way up to the Upper Peninsula to Sand Point Lighthouse, which is in Escanaba. I'm actually headed to this lighthouse in this community uh, this weekend to do a little bit of research. Uh, for my next book. Um, Sandpoint Lighthouse was to be originally tended by a man named um, John Terry. And John Terry was to come in in 1868 when the light was lit, but he died before uh, the lighthouse was complete. And so they appointed his wife, Mary Terry, to serve in his place. And so in 1868, the first person to light the the, the lighthouse here was Mary, and this photograph on the left, you can see her standing uh, there um, uh, by the door of the tower. Uh, that's believed to be the only photograph of, of Mary. Um, so she served there for 18 years, very diligent in her job, very well respected in town, saved her money, owned other property in town. And uh, her story ended tragically um, in uh, March of uh, 1886 when uh, there was a fire at the lighthouse. And there are some differences of opinion in town and among historians about what happened that day. Uh, we know she died in the fire, but there are some who speculate that it was not an accident and that Mary was actually murdered and the fire was started to cover up that crime. So on the night of the fire, and uh, I wanna say it was like March 6th, so we're coming up on the anniversary of that, um, the fire broke out shortly after midnight and they ended up finding Mary's remains kind of, so where the, the, car, the cutout of her is with her name, that window there beside her goes to the to the lower level storeroom. In the historical photo, it would have been on the other side of the tower. And it had a few steps that went down and then there was a door and they found Mary's remains there. And what they found was suspicious was that the door had been knocked off of its hinges, like someone had kicked the door in from the outside. And Mary's body was there in the middle of the night where she really should have been in her bed. And there are thoughts that she actually heard someone break in, kicking in that door. She went downstairs to the lower level to investigate the situation. There was an intruder or multiple intruders. There was a struggle. She was killed and the fire was started to make it look like she died accidentally. Um, she was known to keep all of her money at the lighthouse. And there was these, these early newspaper articles from that era where it actually talks about um, robbery and murder as a possible cause. Now, the furnace was uh, supposedly in bad order, so it could have been an accident. Um, but the, the, the kick door is the thing that kind of uh, throws it for me that there were, um, there were some, some interesting things going on. But they've never solved it. There is no um, definitive answer on what, how she died. And there was not enough left of her body to do any kind of investigation on that. Um, and uh, so we're, we're left with a lot of questions about Mary's death. Uh, so I'm gonna do a little bit of research. My next book, uh, so my first book is Michigan's Haunted Lighthouses, which has some of the ghost stories from our female keepers. My next book is about lighthouse keepers who died under tragic, uh, potentially mysterious uh, cases such as Mary. So I'll be heading up there to do uh, some research on that front. 
Uh, up on Lake Superior in the Apostle Islands, uh, we have a lighthouse uh, on Michigan Island and one of the most noted families there uh, to serve during um, the, uh, the late 1890s, 1893 to 1898. Uh, was the Carlson family. Um, so I'm going to show a couple different photos of the lighthouse. This is uh, as it would have looked in the early 1900s, shortly after they left. Um, and we also are going to see a photograph in a minute that shows what it what it looks like in the Apostle Islands during a traditional winter, because the story in question revolves around uh, a winter when the Carlsons decided to stay at Michigan Island. Now with the island lights um, or the offshore lights that are built on cribs in Michigan, um, where families never served, but uh, during those cases, when the shipping season ended in typically in December, the lighthouse keepers would be given the option if they wanted to spend the winter there or if they wanted to go to a mainland light uh, and then come back to the island in April or so. Uh, when the ice breaks up and when the shipping season starts. Well, this one particular um, winter in the 1890s, Anna Maria Carlson and her husband Robert decided that they were going to stay on Michigan Island. Uh, Robert's brother was an assistant keeper, so he was there as well. They had with them their daughter, Cecilia, who at the time was about three, and her twin brothers, Robert and Carl, who were about a year old. And um, the account of what happened actually appeared in a newspaper article in the 1930s. Um, and uh, Anna Maria talks about how they decided to stay on. They had a, a nanny, a hired girl that stayed with them typically, who promised to stay with them, but she slipped ashore with some fishermen and never came back. And so poor Anna Maria was left there uh, on this island, she was a Chicago girl and she never really got accustomed to island lighthouse keeping and to Lake Superior life. Um, so on this particular day, uh, Robert and his brother decide that they're gonna take their dogs and they're gonna go fishing. And it is a blustery, cold, brutal day outside. And uh, they are standing on the shoreline of the island and they uh, are trying to do some fishing, get some fish for dinner to feed the family. And this is kind of what it probably looked like. This is actually a different island lighthouse in the Apostle Islands, but it shows you how much snow and ice builds up in that part of, of Lake Superior. Well, while they're standing on the shoreline doing their fishing, the section of ice that they were on broke off and it started to drift in Lake Superior with them on it. And it actually drifted uh, southwest to Madeline Island and they were gone for days. And, and in this newspaper article, Anna Maria goes into extensive detail about how they don't come home at the end of the night and she's distraught and doesn't know how to get by and doesn't know what to do. And the next day she goes out and she has to figure out how to milk the cow and she's never milked the cow. So she doesn't really know how to do this, but she, she, she figures it out in a very bizarre way. And she gets, uh, feeds the chickens and gets the eggs and takes care of the children. And, um, and she does this and, and the men don't come for a second night and they don't come for a third night. And she is about ready to go mad uh, for being locked up on this island in the winter with these these three children, just not knowing what's going on with her husband. Well, on the fourth day, he makes it back. And what he reveals to her is that the ice broke off, they drifted to Madeline Island, and there they survived on gruel that they, they found some flour and melted some um, snow and made this gruel to live on and that they were walking around Madeline Island and they found an old um, rowboat with a hole in it and they patched it up somehow and they rowed back across road um, eight miles of stormy waters to get back home. 
And this story was just incredible. And I'd read the, uh, the transcripts of the article for years. And a couple of years ago, I actually uh, emailed uh, or sent a Facebook message to the Detroit News, and it made the front page of their feature section in May of 1931. And they sent me a PDF of the actual article. And it's the entire front page and, you know, the whole length of paper and then covers some space inside as well with this harrowing story about how they ended up surviving that that winter on Michigan Island. She says in there, they never tried to stay through the winter on uh, an island lighthouse again, Um, but they did stay uh, in service. They actually went. Um, from Michigan Island and uh, were transferred into uh, the Marquette Lighthouse. And they were there from 1898 to 1903. Uh, Their children uh, were were growing up at that particular light. And we'll actually come back to this lighthouse here in just a little bit. Um, And then they ended up serving their final years, uh, 1903, 1931. at the uh, Whitefish Point Light Station, uh, where this is, of course, where the Edmund Fitzgerald sank in 1975. And uh, by then, their children uh, were grown, and their oldest uh, child, Cecilia, their only daughter, uh, had uh, a lot of issues into her teenage and adult life. She was actually married at 16, uh, became a teenage bride and a teenage mother, Uh, And these are her two children here. This is Bertha and Robert. Um, And I did a a significant amount of um, genealogical research on this family because um, both the Marquette Lighthouse and Whitefish Point are also haunted. And um, they believe that the ghost at Whitefish Point is Bertha, the, the, um, um, the granddaughter, and then the potential ghost at Marquette is Cecilia, their daughter. So I was doing a lot of genealogical research um, with this family and Bertha, uh, the granddaughter lived into her nineties and she was actually very involved in the restoration of Whitefish Point Lighthouse. Uh, She dedicated and donated a lot of her family archives. So if you go through the museum, uh, any of the Robinson archives that are there, she donated um her they have one of the bedrooms in the lighthouse is her bedroom and it's decorated as it was when she lived there as a as a um, young teenager and uh one of the paranormal groups i work with actually caught some video of her spirit in that bedroom so a great family history uh with the carlsons uh serving uh, gosh they started their service in 1891 and retired in 1931 um, so we're going to backtrack a little bit uh, back to the Keweenaw Peninsula and to the Eagle Harbor uh, range light there. Um, and this is where Mary Ann Wheatley uh, served as a keeper. Her husband was actually a keeper in the area and served a lot of times if they had island lights nearby, they would take care of several lights and they would just take boats out to the various lights which allowed again for the wife to assist in those uh, duties. And uh, Mary Ann Wheatley ended up serving um, at the lighthouse uh, in 1889. And uh, she didn't serve there for very long. She left, but I believe she came back at a later time and served um, at, uh, at the lighthouse as well. And they have um, several of the artifacts from this family on display. It's a museum that you can go to there in Eagle Harbor um, in the uh, in the Keweenaw Peninsula. Um, this is another, the next one we're coming up to is another interesting one. This is the Bay Degree Bay Light, also known as Mendota. And this isn't actually a lighthouse photo, but it's a, it's an interesting story tied to um, the lighthouse that was eventually built in this community, also on the q and up as well. Um, so the woman it, circled in the photo uh, is Henrietta Berg. And she and her husband lived in this area and they had a house on the mainland. 
And then they also owned what was called Berg Island, just offshore, which today is known as Rabbit Island. And Rabbit Island actually is an art um, facility. They have um, art in residence programs there, and they have a, a, just a great history. Um, but Henrietta actually um, lived in this log home in town, which is no longer there. And her husband was a fisherman. And when he would go out fishing at night, he would ask her to put a lantern in that upper window so that as he was rowing back from fishing, he knew where the house was. Well, the other fishermen in town were pretty smart and they figured out that, um, that she was doing this. And so when they would go fishing, they would say, Henrietta, will you put the light up for us? So over the course of several years in uh, the late, uh, early, late 1880s and early 1890s, she would put this lantern out for the fishermen who would go out. And uh, so it was an unofficial lighthouse with an unofficial keeper. But the town eventually did build a light in 1895. Uh, she was not a keeper of that light. Uh, but they did finally recognize the need for a lighthouse in that community. It was actually a very short-lived light. Uh, it did not stay in operation for very long. And the building itself uh, was sold off as excess property, purchased by a private citizen, and turned into a, uh, a home. And uh, it also sold again last summer. Uh, I don't know what the final sales price was, but it was listed uh, for $495,000. I did visit their website today just to kind of check in and see uh, what the latest thing was. Uh, and they do have a note on the bottom of the website that says, if you're interested in touring, you know, to drop them an email that they're the new owners. The new website is quite nice. It has a lot of great history about the light, the area, and the first keeper uh, of that light as well. So you check that out. Uh, I told you we'd be back in Marquette and here we are. Um, one of the other female keepers at this light uh, was a woman by the name of Anastasia Truckee. They called her Eliza and she served um, at this lighthouse from 1861 to 1865 while her husband Nelson here was um, serving in the Civil War. And um, she was also uh, noted to be quite friendly with the Native Americans that were in this area. They, in fact, called her Mother of the Light. And she was very instrumental in the community in communicating between the local white men and the Native Americans and would often be called in um, to assist with uh, negotiations or discussions um, if there were also um, arguments that were taking place between um, the folks. Eliza would come in and she would kind of mediate these disagreements. And uh, probably close to 20 years ago, I connected with one of her descendants, who I'll introduce you to momentarily, and she sent me some handwritten notes and letters, and in that, she talks about how through Eliza's um, diplomacy, she was instrumental in several of the white men being allowed to keep their scalps, uh, because it, arguments had gotten so heated that some of the Native Americans were threatening to attack the men and she kind of came in and calmed everyone down. Now, Nelson and Eliza had a daughter by the name of Frances, uh, Frances Emma, and uh, she married a gentleman uh, by the name of Shanley. And it was their daughter, Chris Shanley Dillman, who I uh, found online almost 20 years ago, who shared with me uh, quite a bit of the stories and the photographs of the family. And Christine is an author, and she wrote a historical novel uh, called Finding My Light. And it is based on her mother's 
teenage years growing up as the daughter of a lighthouse keeper and Civil War soldier on the shores of Lake Superior. And uh, so it is um, it is her testament and her legacy to her to her family story there in Marquette. Uh, we're heading now over to uh, Lake Huron for our last few lighthouses and some of our more noted female characters who have tended lights there. Um, the old Presque Isle Lighthouse uh, was a very short-lived light. I think it operated really only for about 30 or 40 years. Um, and one of the most noted families tied to this area were the Garrity family. Now, the Presque Isle is north of Alpena, and they had an old light, they have a new light, and they have a set of range lights. So this small little community has four uh, active navigational beacons in its community. And I think almost every member of the Garrity family served in various capacities over the years at these, at these various lights. So this is Mother Mary on the left. She was uh, married to Patrick Sr. And they were the head keepers at the old Presque Isle Lighthouse. Uh, their daughter, Anna, was the keeper of the range light, the rear range light, as you can see that there. And they have this great little metal sculpture uh, dedicated to her on the grounds of that. Um, I think they had another daughter and three or four sons. And I think at one point they all served in different capacities. I actually presented um, my Haunted Lighthouse program in this community in the fall of 2019. And there were descendants of the Garrity family there. Uh, and I got a chance to talk with them. And then we got a chance to actually go to the lighthouse, the old lighthouse after dark, after the presentation and walk around. And so that was kind of neat to be able to do that with, um, with some of the members of the family as well. Uh, more recently, uh, in the uh, 70s and 80s and 90s, the keepers or the, the uh, curators, I guess, of the museum that operated there at that time were Lorraine Paris and her husband, George. And I met Lorraine uh, probably 20 years ago at the Great Lakes Lighthouse Festival in Alpena. And I met her um, when I presented at the lighthouse about five or six years ago. She was wearing the same outfit. I gave her kudos to be able to fit into the same thing for 20 years, because I know I can't do that. Um, but she was just this great spunky lady. She had all kinds of stories about George and their years there. She was done even after he passed away in the early 90s. And she shared with me, we sat together at dinner and she shared with me all kinds of ghost stories uh, about George who stayed on at the light and was there uh, and people still say that they will have encounters with him even today. Now, this lighthouse is noted as being, an, uh, it's not an active light. It's decommissioned. However, ships traveling through the area, people at the marina, many people in town say that over the course of its history, it has, it has been noted to shine, even though there's no electricity to the top of it, even though it is not active. And when I gave that presentation there in uh, September of, of 19, I had about 80 people and I asked them, how many of you have seen that light shining in your lifetime? And I wanna say 90% of the hands went up. And I said, how many of you have seen it more than once? And about 75% of the hands stayed up. And I you know, drove out there and we took the tour around after dark and then I left and I never got a chance to see it. So I feel kind of slighted uh, about that whole situation, but maybe one of these days I'll actually see the uh, the shining light from the old Presque Isle lighthouse. Um, now, when that light was decommissioned, the Garrity family also became the very first keepers at the new Presque Isle lighthouse, which is just up the road, uh, a much taller tower um, in a more suitable location for the lighthouse. That was why the the other one was decommissioned and this one was built. And so uh, the Garrity's actually, as I mentioned, had ties to all three of the lighthouses, uh, four lighthouses, I guess, in this, uh, in this little community. <clears throat> Making our way further down the coastline, we are now in Saginaw Bay. 
and the Saginaw River Rear Range Lighthouse. And the first keepers of this light were the Brawns. Peter Braun there uh, at the top in the center, uh, he was the head keeper and he was, uh, was brought in when the light was first um, lit in 1866. He was there with his wife, Julia, and one of their children, DeWitt, who is the young man at the bottom of the photograph. Uh, in the group photo, um, Peter is this man in the center, Julia directly in front of him and then DeWitt to her right. Now, shortly after they got to the lighthouse, um, Peter fell ill and was bedridden for the better part of nine years. And Julia was an unofficial keeper and she and DeWitt took care of the light and um, were active in the, in the community. And when Peter died, she was then appointed as uh, the head keeper. Uh, so that was in 1873, and shortly after that, she got remarried to a man by the name of George Way. I don't have a photograph of him. Um, it was what, from what I called a scandalous marriage, because I think he was 13 years younger than she was. Um, she had no experience as a lighthouse keeper, but shortly after their marriage, she was demoted. He was put in charge of the lighthouse. And then I, shortly after that, they abolished her position altogether. And I have some question about whether they were trying to get rid of her in that community because um, she'd clearly done the job for many years without fail uh, to be removed from her position and then to, to really force her out by eliminating her position. Uh, shortly after that happened, um, um, George passed away as well, and she left the service altogether, and uh, neither her nor DeWitt worked at the light. Um, she passed away um, shortly after that in 1889, and she is buried uh, in a cemetery in Bay City, and uh, her husband, Peter, his grave, of course, uh, was, uh, he was buried before he died because he died first. So his grave uh, head marker, it actually fell down is in the ground. And it's interesting because even though she got remarried, it says Braun on her tombstone. And I've been told by the historians at the Saginaw River Marine Historical Society, uh, and they manage the lighthouse for Dow Chemical, who owns it, that both that that uh, the second husband is buried in this other plot. So she's there with both of the husbands at the cemetery, which I find kind of interesting as well. Um, and uh, now we are coming to our last light, um, but it's significant because this is where the very first female keeper uh, took charge. This is the Point All Barks Lighthouse. And uh, this is near Port Austin, the tip of the thumb. Uh, this is a pencil drawing of what the first lighthouse looked like. Um, and this is where the keeper was Peter Shook. And uh, Peter uh, was there with his wife, Catherine. They had eight children. And in 1849, he died uh, along with a local doctor who had been summoned to take care of Catherine who had been ill. And Peter and the doctor had gone by boat back to take the doctor back to Port Huron. And the boat capsized and the men both died and, and neither body were recovered. So Catherine was then given the appointment as the head keeper. And uh, that was in April. And I believe in June, there was a, a major fire at the lighthouse and she was injured. Uh, the, the dwelling was severely damaged because of a, um, of a chimney fire. And uh, the house and the light were not attached at the time, so the tower didn't suffer any damage. But this letter here is from the lighthouse inspector. And in it, he talks about how uh, she had recently lost her husband. She's trying to raise her children. Um, there was no fault of her own for the fire. It was a chimney fire and, and authorizing the repairs to be done immediately because they were all living in a lean-to. Now, thankfully, it was a summer 
it was summertime so they could be outside but in this letter he also throws in a couple other things like while you're here why don't you paint the tower too so he was it was trying to help her out a little bit with giving her a few added perks uh getting the lighthouse uh back up uh up to snuff there uh as i said peter his body was never found but he is noted on her headstone she's buried at a cemetery in new baltimore um and descendants of her fa of their family have kept several lights in fact the port sanilac lighthouse is currently owned by one of their descendants a gentleman by the name of Jeff. Now, if you are interested in more details about these and many of the other lights, uh, ladies of the lights that I did not get to, these books are um, available through libraries. And if it's not available at your local library there in Auburn Hills, you can probably get it through interlibrary loan. Um, and they tell many other great stories. The first book that really got me hooked on uh, these female keepers was um, the women who kept the lights on the top. And uh, the Cliffords, I believe it's a mother or daughter, uh, they wrote this book and they also are historians um, with great resources online for not just uh, female keepers, but lighthouses in general. Um, Child of the Sea, that's Elizabeth's um, autobiography. There's also a children's book about her life. And then Ladies of the Lights, uh, you'll notice is the same title as, as this presentation. Um, my friend Pat Major wrote that book. Pat was the head of the, um, she was the executive director of the Michigan Women's Hall of Fame and History Museum in Lansing back when I first nominated Elizabeth Whitney Williams to be in the Hall of Fame. And she had an exhibit at the museum and she asked me to give a, this presentation down there. And we had lunch at Clara's restaurant in Lansing and talked about it and she came back later and said she'd really like to like write a book and would I be okay with her using the title of my program and uh, I was excited about that it was before I had written any books and so I turned over all of my research and my information you'll notice Elizabeth's photo in the Beaver Island Lighthouse there on the cover of her book uh, she gives a nice little shout out to me in the acknowledgments um, and uh, so that has a great deal of information and she found a lot more uh, information than what I had originally. So we've we've kept in touch with sharing information uh, with each other as well. And then uh, just a little uh, shameless plug for my book, uh, Michigan's Haunted Lighthouses. Uh, as I mentioned, many of these haunted lighthouses had female keepers. So if you look at that map, we have White River Light Station, South Manitou Island, Marquette, Whitefish Point, Old Presqu'il, Saginaw River, and Point Al Barks, um, all uh, featured in my book, uh, are all ones that also had women uh, who were keepers. So you can kind of get a little bit uh, of both with those. And uh, you can, uh, I'll put the link in the chat if anybody's interested in, in acquiring a copy, autograph copy of that book. And then finally, uh, if you are interested in additional research, uh, if you are like I am and you get into these things and go, wow, I really want to know more about uh, lighthouses in Michigan or the Great Lakes or more about these keepers, uh, and I'll put these all in the chat as well. But these are the three websites that I visit regularly anytime I'm doing research on lighthouses in Michigan. The Great Lakes Lighthouse Keepers Association, which is based in Mackinac City, at Glicka.com. Um, they have... Uh, information on the various lights. They'll tell you which ones operate as bed and breakfast, which ones are museums. They do events in the Straits of Mackinac. They do uh, trips out to St. Helena Island, trips up to St. Mary's River. They are a great organization. Uh, Terry Pepper was the president of the Lighthouse Keepers Association until he passed away in early 2019, but they have maintained his website, terrypepper.com, and that really, I was actually on it a couple times today, has so much information uh, about the lights of Michigan. You can search um, by Great Lake, uh, Lake Michigan, Lake Huron, or Lake Superior, or you can search by Illinois, Indiana, uh, Michigan, and Wisconsin. And he has anywhere from four to 14 pages of, of information on all of these lights, great photographs, and links in most of those pages to the list of keepers that served 
at that particular lighthouse uh, over the course of the history. And then the Lighthouse Research Catalog at, um, at archives.uslhs.org. Uh, the Cliffords uh, actually maintain a lot of this uh, along with a Coast Guard website. Uh, um, this has information about lighthouses all over, um, not just Michigan, but throughout the United States as well. And you can find uh, details there about um, keepers and lighthouses, but also about various ships that traveled um, through the Great Lakes region as well. And with that, um, I am going to uh, wrap up my part of the presentation and um, I'll stop the screen share here momentarily and we'll open up conversations either uh, through video or through chat. And then I'll make sure to put these various links in the chat um, for anybody who wants those as well. So thank you for uh, allowing me to share some of my stories. Um, again, I'm just, I'm fascinated with these women who really were doing it all in the 1800s for the government. I mean, how great is that? No. All right, just a reminder that um, we are live on Facebook and this video is being recorded as well. So if you would like, um, if, if you're comfortable, you can turn your video on, just know that it might appear on our um, social media as well. Um, if anyone has any questions, you guys can feel free to drop those in the chat or um, we can do some, some mitigated uh, question time here. Um, I did see one on uh, Facebook, actually. Someone was asking if you do presentation on lighthouse hauntings. Um, yeah. And I think you, you mentioned your book here as well. Um, yes, um, that one is, I haven't done it on virtually yet uh, because it's so much better in person when the lights are all down. Um, so I'm kind of hoping that by fall, we'll be back to doing some live programming. Um, but if you go to my website, and I'll put that in there as well, promotemichigan.com, um, I put all of the programs, and it'll tell you if it's virtual or if it's in person. And um, I did get quite a few in last year. Now, the year my book came out, I did 65 live programs. I think I did six last year. But... They're coming back and people are getting vaccinated and things are moving forward. So um, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to do some of those live programs. Did notice um, uh, we had one question in the, in the chat if this was available on tape and how to get a copy. Uh, it will be posted to YouTube and I will send a link to that to everyone who is registered for the event. Um, it is also available on Facebook. Uh, if you go to the library's Facebook page, and I believe Diana has shared it to her pages as well. Um, and then Clay, it looked like, uh, yes, you had a question yes. there? I believe you did a presentation at the Troy Library. I did, I yes. Ago. I saw that one. It really is highly entertaining, and I hope you're able to do it live again. You know, that was a very special one for me because my one of my great cousins was there, my dad's my dad's first cousin's wife, who's a dear friend, and she lives in Troy, and she came to that program, and um, I promise I'm going to come back and visit soon, to her soon, so I'm hoping to get back down there, but yeah, that was a fun one, and that was a big crowd. That was a huge crowd and a, a wonderful uh, presentation. Well, thank you. Appreciate it. Glad you can make it to this one as well. <laughs> We also had a question in the chat of what is your favorite lighthouse? Okay, how many of you have grandchildren? You can't ask that question. <laughs> then I'm gonna get, somebody's gonna get upset with me, right? Um, I do kind of have a few favorites. One of them is actually South Manitou Island. And because um, years ago, I was a guest of the National Park Service and the Manitou Memorial Society. I had given um, both of my presentations, my haunted and my ladies programs for them. And they, that was my first trip to the island. And they not only took care of me on the island, but they let me stay in the Coast Guard Life Saving Station. Normally you have to camp and it's rustic camping. And that really wasn't my thing back then. I'm a little okay with it now. Um, but I got to stay, I can't remember if it was two or three nights in the actual Coast Guard station, which had a bed, a bathroom, a shower, cable TV, internet, a full kitchen, 
and they left this giant gift basket for us um, with this, these cinnamon rolls the size of your head. I never did find out where they got them. And bottles of wine and all this other stuff. And at four o'clock when the boat left to take everybody back to the mainland, the park rangers who live on the island and some other houses that still exist, they tossed me the keys to the lighthouse and said, it's yours, lock it up when you're done. And it was the end of July. And I think it was 2004. Uh, and I remember it was the end of July because it was my daughter's birthday and I got in trouble for not being with her on her birthday. But we went up to the top. I was ghost hunting. I was trying to find the ghost at the top of the tower. And we, you know, if you've been through lighthouses, especially tall ones, there are landings. So we would sit on the landing and listen nothing and we go to the next landing and listen and we finally got to the top of the tower and it was about sunset and it was a full moon night so we got to watch the sunset we got to watch some freighters come through the moon came out it was a full moon and even with a full moon there was a blue moon so it was the second full moon of the month and two bottles of wine we never did see any ghosts <laughs> and but it's like, it's one of the greatest stories because I had the access, you know, we went up there and basically stay, I think we were up there till well after midnight and uh, never did have any ghostly encounters, but it, that, that light always had a very special uh, place in my heart. Are you familiar with Wagashants? I am very familiar with Wagashants. Yes, that's wow. in my book as well uh, as Haunted. And I'm, I'm afraid we're going to lose understand it. how it was haunted. Uh, oh, yes, by John Herman. Well, there were people also in there cutting up the brass rails on the stairways. Oh, and so when you see those flashes of light on and off, it was it was the welding torches. Oh, really? Well, I know they also bombed it. Um, they used it for bombing practice during World War II. Oh, God, love her. She, and she's in such terrible shape. Yeah, well, and it's getting worse. That She actually made the news again this winter with the yep. high water levels. It's really destroyed the cribbing. Um, Wagashant is near Mackinac, and it was decommissioned in 1910, and then it was bombed during World War II. And, of course, weather does its own damage, and then critters get in and people get in and steal things and it's just it's number yeah. one on the doomsday list in the great lakes region and um they tried last year to get money to kind of just come in and and build up a thing around it and fill it with rocks to keep it from falling over yeah and I think it cost i can't remember now it was it was under a hundred thousand to build and it was going to be like three million just to yeah. stabilize it. Yeah, and I couldn't, they can't do that. The thing they can do though, is save that birdcage top. Yes, that, that's, that'd be really that's... nice to have on display somewhere in Mackinac yeah. City for sure. Um, yeah. It's one of only two birdcage uh, lanterns on the on Lake Michigan. I think the other one is, is in Door County. I can't remember what light is that. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, John Herman is the ghost there. And uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, I've had actually in the book, I have two friends who had actual experiences with his ghost out there. So it was kind of neat to be able to share their uh, firsthand, um, their firsthand experiences. So, oh, someone asking how to book me as a speaker. That's another great question. And I will post that. Um, there's a specific page on promotemichigan.com called Speakers Bureau. And it has um, details uh, about the presentation as well as other programs that I do. So I talk about lighthouses, I, talk, I collect vintage postcards, I talk about winter activities. Uh, I'm bringing back my covered bridges, uh, which is another area I'm quite fascinated with. Um, so I have a, a great program on Michigan food and agriculture, but that's an in-person one because I bring treats for everybody. <laughs> so, you know, keep that in mind. That's a good one for the fall when like there's fresh apples and and other fresh produce and stuff like that. So, um, but I, I love uh, I love going out and sharing stories. There's so many great stories in Michigan, and uh, I never would have thought a year ago when we got locked down that I would be doing uh, so many Zoom presentations. Um, but this is my second today, and I have about 12 this month. So, 
um, always popular in, in for Women's History Month to talk about our, our ladies. I did have one more question for you too, Diana. Um, I was wondering what you find most inspiring about some of these female lighthouse keepers. Um, well, I think, I mean, their whole story is just fascinating that they, you look at how today, you know, women are going to work and they're taking care of their family and now they're homeschooling children and everything else. And you look at that and go, wow, that really mirrors a lot about what these female keepers were doing. Um, they, they worked relentlessly at a, a very tough job. I mean, if you, how many, I'm assuming most people have climbed a lighthouse. Oh, yeah. Can you imagine going, I mean, um, I think it's 117 steps to the top of South Manitou every single day, several times a day. Imagine what they like. Um, but they had to wear dresses. They didn't have a male uniform. So they're hauling all that stuff in dresses and their determination to make it, especially, you know, most cases they were taking over for a husband who died. So you're dealing with that tragic loss, that personal um, uh, depression that you would go through at the loss of that. And I think Elizabeth really is the finest example because in her book, she talks about, you know, I lost my husband. I lost my brother's. And if I can do something to save someone else from dying, I will do this job day in and day out, even if it means I can't sleep because it's my duty to protect other people. And I just, I just find all so many areas of what they were doing uh, so inspiring and never giving up on the job and taking care of the house and feeding the family and raising their children. I mean, it, it really, it, it's just such an unheard of story. I'm surprised, you know, there's a handful of books and, and I talk and Pat talks about this and there's a few of us that are out there doing that, but there really hasn't been any big national attention. And I think there really should be. I mean, these women were were so unique and so uh, strong in so many ways. And I think that their story really should be told. Well, thank you for telling it. Well, tell everybody else too. Cause I think, you know, and hopefully we'll get Elizabeth in the hall of fame this year. Um, I don't know, maybe I'll have to find a couple national uh, news outlets to do some stories. I mean. None of these lighthouses are manned currently. They're all um, automated. So you really don't have um, anybody that's, that's really in service. The last one was Francis Johnson in Whitehall and then Karen who kind of was a museum person, but the actual, actual last person, woman to tend and take care of the light itself was Francis in Whitehall. And that she retired in the fifties. Well, I, I'm so happy everybody came out. If um, On that Speaker Bureau page on my website is the list of other programs at other libraries that I have this month. So if you have friends that you think will be interested, pass the word along. We'll have more people join, share the stories. Okay. Thank you everyone for coming and thank you, Diana, for your presentation. Thank you very much, everyone.